Okay, let's go ahead. So the first talk of the session is going to be by June Kono from Rice University. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and I, I want to thank the organizers. So this talk is about cavity QED and condensed matter systems, uh, especially in the ultra-strong coupling. Program. We already heard some beautiful talks about cavity effects on materials. The, the overall goal is to use um, cavity enhanced uh, vacuum, quantum vacuum fields to modify and control material properties. So the, this kind of approach is um, alternative or complementary to a free space driving, ultra fast driving pump probe type approaches uh, overall to uh, control material properties with, with light. But there are distinct differences. So instead of driving using external light, what we do is we, we just place our material inside, inside a cavity. And then we, we watch but, uh, the influence of the, of the cavity, cavity fields. And so obviously, so instead of studying non-equilibrium uh, dynamics, we are more interested in probing the ground state properties of the system in thermal equilibrium modified through interactions with cavity photons. So the our approach consists of the following. First, we design our cavity in such a way that one of the photonic modes becomes resonant with, with a certain resonance or transition in, in the system. Let's say if we have a two-level two level atom, so the our, our photonic frequency is resonant with the one to two uh, transition. And thanks to the cavity confinement of uh, electromagnetic fields, we have a huge enhancement, enhancement of the electric fields of, of, of the electromagnetic fields that leads us to, uh, to the so-called strong coupling regime, where the light matter coupling rate is higher than any other rates in the system. So the dynamics of the system is completely dominated by the light matter interaction. Now the question is how strong? How strong the, is, is the coupling? Is it strong or ultra strong, <laughs> deep strong or super strong or very strong, extremely strong or ridiculously strong? This is, there are many, this is, this, this may sound stupid, but I want to spend spend a few minutes to uh, explaining these different regimes. Is this a joke or are these names? No, this, these, these are real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are real names. Real names. This is not a joke. Yeah. <laughs> As you can see, they have clear definitions. <laughs> so first of all, the, yeah, so this, this this talk is about strong coupling, but I want to say that the even in the weak coupling regime, there are interesting phenomena uh, due to cavity photon matter coupling, and they I wanted to talk about this, but John already beautifully explained this. There's nothing left for me to say about the self effect, except we can do the opposite. You know, they uh, one of my uh, distinguished colleagues. Randy Hewlett, AMO superstar, he, when he was a graduate student, he demonstrated that uh, one can inhibit spontaneous radiation by removing, eliminating the photonic uh, density of states at the transition frequency. So one can do the opposite of the Purcell effect as well. So this can happen also in the weak coupling regime. So what is strong coupling? So strong coupling means Hybridization. Hybridization means polariton formation. Polariton formation means anti-crossing. So the anti-crossing, so at the zero detuning, there's a 50% 50% superposition of light and matter. At, at large detuning, we have matter and photon. So uh, all, my, all my students are working on different types of polaritons. Uh, whenever 
whenever they see an anti crossing, they dance. That, that's the polite <laughs> on dance. So we have Lambda Politons, Exiton Politons, Xenon Politons, Magnon Politons, Onon Politons. So all, these are rather traditional Politons in the sense that they all involve photons. So they're all light matter coupling uh, polaritons. But we also have some exotic polaritons without invo involving light. So we have spin magnon ultra strong coupling, magnon magnon ultra strong coupling, and plasmon plasmon uh, ultra strong coupling. So in order to define uh, different regimes a little bit more quantitatively, Let's go back to the uh, simplest model, the James Cummings model, which tells us that the Rabi splitting, which is the energy difference between the lower polariton and the upper polariton, can be written in this simple formula. I'm not saying this, this applies to condensed matter systems. So I, I just want to use this simple formula to explain different regimes. So this, as you can see, this depends on three parameters. G delta M. So G is the most important parameter in this context. This is the light matter coupling coupling rate. Right? This is the rate at which the energy is exchanged between the light and matter system. Delta is the detuning, and N is the average number of photons in, in the cavity. And the most relevant and important radius splitting is the own resonance vacuum radius splitting corresponding to delta equals zero, exact resonance, and vacuum, n is zero. Overall, the average number of photons is zero. We're not exciting the system, but the matter is still coupled with uh, the quantum vacuum fields inside for virtual photons. <clears throat> uh, with the, that's why this is so finite, 2G. So the, the 2G is the vacuum rabbi splitting, and whenever this becomes the strongest, largest rate in the system, we are in the strong coupling regime. So the so in the frequency domain, what we should see is that splitting larger than any loss rates. Gamma is the matter decay rate, and kappa is the photon decay rate. So in most of our systems, um, gamma is related to decoherence rates of Electrons, uh, yeah, electron phonon scattering, electron electron scattering. Kappa is related to to the Q factor of of the of the of the cavity. Right? So both both are both are important to, to, to be in the strong coupling region. But strong coupling is is not very novel. You know, the, it, in in atom AMO systems, you can conventionally achieve. What's really unique uh, about condensed matter cavity QED systems is that we can achieve ultra strong coupling. So th there was some uh, discussion this morning, but so traditionally the ultra strong coupling regime is defined as the regime where the light matter coupling rate is comparable to, or even sometimes larger than the resonance frequency. Physically, this, this is a very difficult regime to imagine because G, the energy exchange rate between light and matter can even become faster than the than one oscillation cycle of the original light and matter frequencies, right? So then, therefore, I mean, light and matter are completely undefined. So this energy is going back and forth. So this is a very theoretically very difficult regime. Many, yes. Um, this is where the rotating wave approximation. Yes, comes. yes. So many, so the, the, character, the characteristics of, of this regime are the breakdown of the rotating wave approximation. That's the first thing. So the rotating wave approximation, the two-level approximation, single-mode approximation, dipole approximation, everything breaks down. <laughs> so, so theoretically, it's impossible to, to understand this fully. That's why experiments are very important, right? So, uh, so the important... Key parameter, yes. Just to be clear, you're talking about single photon, like, like not some collective enhancement. You're talking about like in this root n. So, right. so, so, root n, n in terms of matter, yeah, atomic number, yes, but not in terms of photon. So, sure. so here, so, so the 
number of photons is always close to zero. Yes. So, yes. But it is, but you are talking about a collective material. Right. Collective material response. This is, I'm not talking about a single atom G. So, it's so that, in this kind of the oscillator strength of the or no. so no G G let's say G naught is a single single atom like matter coupling, but in in you know, many body system is root n enhancement of the light matter coupling. That's what we are taking advantage of. Yeah. So G, G is that corporate N is the number of variables or no, yes, right. Yes. Like, but you're not talking about G naught. We're not we're not talking about G. Um, so the, yeah, so, so this, this, the, the important parameter is the ratio between G and, and the resonance frequency. So from the beginning of the, of the field of cavity QED, yeah, the Kimball work, uh, first strong coupling regime. So this was, in terms of this parameter, this was 10 to the minus eight. Now the, but in atomic systems, the, the line was so ultra narrow. So they were still able to see a vacuum rugby splitting. But as long as you're working on AMO systems, even now they, they remain well, uh, low in terms of this number. So the first cavity QED in condensed matter systems were done in uh, exciton cavity, micro cavity exciton platons by Weisbuch and uh, uh, Arakawa. So this was already 10 to the minus three. So this number has been growing, growing. And so traditionally, when, when this number becomes larger than 0.1, we say it's, it's ultra strong coupling. And when this becomes larger than one, uh, we say deep strong coupling. But the difference is not very important. Okay, so the, I mean, for me, they're, they're the same thing. But the important thing is the various approximations break down, especially the rotating wave approximation breaks down. But then when we have a multi-mode cavity, things get a little more complicated. There's a new parameter which represents the uh, inter-mode separation. Let's say when, when we have two closely lying photonic modes with a frequency separation of delta omega, okay? And if the coupling is very, very small, and then as a function of the tuning, the matter frequency goes up like this. And then they individually show individual vacuum rugby splitting. But this is not, uh, not the case anymore when you go into the ultra strong and deep strong coupling regime because this becomes comparable to or larger than this. Then we have to start talking about interval coupling. Okay, so this is. So this regime is, is called the uh, uh, super strong. That's right. So super strong coupling regime. So this means that G is larger than delta omega. And it turns out, I, I'll, I'll come back to this issue later, but the, there are two scenarios, the so-called 2N scenario and the N plus one scenario. So the, the N plus one scenario is, is more interesting. I think that uh, Daniel was showing some multi phononic modes. I think his, his system is in, in, in this region. So characteristic of this, the appearance of this big polar top. Right. Um, so yeah. So for experimentalists, we are always looking for materials which have huge dipole moments because within this, again, within this very simple atomistic uh, description, uh, G is simply given by the product uh, of the dipole moment of the transition and the electric field in, uh, strength. Right? So the mu one two is a dipole moment, right? Matrix element between one and two. So we we want to find a material which has a large oscillator strength, and then the E vacuum, which this was already yeah mentioned. Uh, that this is inversely proportional to the square root of the mode volume. So the smaller the mode volume, the better in there. Yeah. So the so G can be controlled both by uh, both the material material choice or resonance choice and the uh, uh, vacuum environment engineering. So we work in the terahertz 
frequency waves. Our, our light is invisible, typically in the terahertz frequency. One terahertz is four milli electron volts. And that's where all kinds of transitions, resonances exist in solid state materials, including magnons and phonons, plasmons and superconducting gap excitation, or cyclotron resonance, electron paramagnetic resonance. So all those transitions have huge dipole moments compared to atoms. That's why we, we love terahertz, but also in terms of the parameter eta, G over omega. So we want to minim minimize omega to increase the, the normalized coupling strength. Instead of being in the visible or near infrared, we go to the terahertz range, but we cannot go too low because if you go too low, carrier scattering rates, they, they dominate. Now we, we want to be rather in the coherent regime where the light matter coupling is, is, is higher than any scattering rate. So there, there are many types of uh, terahertz cavities existing uh, in, the, in, in this field. Some are based on dielectrics and others are based on metals. And the um, some are one dimensional in the sense like fabric thereau or photonic crystal cavities, one dimensional. In some cavities, the light is completely confined three, three dimensionally. So there are all kinds of uh, cavity ideas. So there, there are two key parameters when we design cavities. So one is the Q factor, right? the other is the vacuum electric field, which is basically the mode volume, right? So we want to be here. We want to maximize the Q factor. We want to maximize the electric field strength. And the um, basic uh, dielectric cavities, they have low losses. So they, they, they lead to good, good Q factors, but their confinement is basically on the order of lambda, the, the wavelength, it's because those are diffraction limited. You know, they, but then it, uh, the opposite is metallic metamaterial cavities. So they can confine light very well, very well. So they, the mode volume can be very, very small, but metals are lossy, right? So the Q factor, you, you lose uh, uh, the Q factor, right? So you need some sort of compromise between the dielectrics and metals, between the Q factor and the uh, mode volume. So for the rest of this talk, so this is the outline of this talk. I want to guide you through our journey of of cavity, cavity designing in terms of uh, material uh, cavity QED, starting from a simple fabric perot cavity, going to one dimensional photonic crystal cavity, going to a compromise called the TAM cavity, going to a three dimensional photonic crystal cavity, finally going to a more metamaterial, the terra nano cavity, and eventually we go here. Go here. Uh, yes. What do the letters BIC stand for? BIC means like bound, bound states in, in the continuum, yes. Bound states in the continuum. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, they, they produce extremely narrow lines. Yeah. Okay. So let me start with the first simple Fabry Perot. Because Fabry Perot, if you have a pair of mirrors, you have a Fabry Perot cavity. But we, but we found that the the easiest way to make a public parole cavity is just to thin down your sample. I think there was uh, one discussion this, this morning about thin films of right, STO, right? So that's the kind of thing we, we're interested in. Yeah, so when, when, you, when you thin down, basically you, you're making cavity, right? So the electromagnetic field, vacuum electromagnetic fields can change something in, 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 in the sample. Right. Yeah. So I mean, typically we we are annoyed by by the appearance of Fabry-Perot fringes when we do spectroscopy in the infrared terahertz range. Um, yeah. There are lots of uh, periodic oscillations in our know, transmission spectra, and we we try to typically try to remove them right by wedging your sample. Or if you're doing time domain spectroscopy, you just look at the first pulse and removing all the other subsequent pulses. But in this case, actually, we, we are collecting everything. Right? So all the multiple uh, uh, 
a reflection. So it's 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 good for, for this. So we have yeah, multiple probably payroll modes, and then the there's a two example of this is a magnum polariton example in nickel oxide, which is an anti-ferromagnetic insulator. This is at uh, no, for at Zeman polaritons in uh, GGT, galvanium, gallium, gallium. I want to focus on, on this uh, unpublished work first. So they, there are multiple reasons that I like this system. So they, the, the first reason is um, this system faithfully represents the original Dickey system in, in a condensed matter system. You know, the, when we talk about magnons or plasmons or phonons or even cycloton resonance, typically we're talking about boson-boson coupling. So the matter, matter excitation is a bosonic excitation. And of course, photons are boson. So the Hamiltonian is, is called the Hope field Hamiltonian, which describes boson-boson interaction. But what it means is it's just the interaction between two simple harmonic oscillators. And the, the basically 99% of our spectra can be reproduced by Maxwell solvers. So classical electromagnetism can explain everything, even though we say quantum you know, cavity QED, but there's no Q in, in, in that system. So we want something more quantum, right? So they, so here we're uh, talking about an ensemble of paramagnetic spins. So the lambda levels, for example, uh, you have an infinite ladder of lambda levels with a simple harmonic oscillator. But spins, you have a finite number of spins. Let's say it's a two-level atom. So this is this is closer to the original Dickey Hamiltonian, which describes the interaction between a uh, uh, collective interaction between an ensemble of two-level atoms and a single mode of cavity photons. And the another thing is uh, the interaction. So typically, we, we deal with electric dipole like matter interaction, uh, which is A dot P. But in this case, uh, the, if we forget about spin orbit interaction, the light matter interaction is M dot H. So the, the H is the external field, M is the magnetization in, in the system. So, this, so the nature of the light matter coupling is different in spin systems compared to other, other types of systems. So in reality, in this system, this is a 4F electron system. There are seven electrons. Um, the, yeah, so the orbital angular momentum is quenched. So the total angular momentum is seven half, which is the spin angular momentum. A little bit complicated. So I mean, seven, seven half instead of one half. Still, we have a finite number of states as opposed to infinite. In the case of lambda levels, right? So that the, uh, the temperature matters because it, at different temperatures, uh, there's a different carrier distribution in the system that changes the magnetization through Curie's law. So that changes the spectrum. Basically, yes. How many spins approximately are we going to be talking about? Ten to the uh, twenty for. <laughs> But then isn't that basically a bosonic load? So, okay. Yeah. So, yes. So, in terms of light, in terms of the nature of light matter coupling, it's still bosonic, unfortunately. Yes, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. So, the so called Holstein Primakov transformation changes our spin system into a boson boson system. So, in terms of light matter coupling, it's still uh, up here. But what I will show you is that the light matter coupling rate G is temperature dependent, which is something new for us because G is usually constant as a function of temperature. But in this case, G changes depending on the magnetization of, of, of the system, right? So, so the so the matter mode we 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 probe here is the electron paramagnetic resonance. So yeah, so J and S are seven half, L is zero. So the Effective G factor is, is two, right? So this is the magnetization, which it depends on both temperature and magnetic field. So we do terahertz spectroscopy as a function of temperature and magnetic field. 
So this is the this is the matter node that changes with the magnetic field. So we have a unique terahertz um, magnetos spectrometer called Rambo, which allows us to go to uh, about 25 tesla or even 30 tesla. So no, we, we can go up to 40 tesla now. It's a tabletop uh, system. So the yeah, so this kind of Zeeman polaritons are very temperature dependent. And we found that the at high temperatures, there's a single mode. It, this is transmission. And then and then as, as we cool down, there's a critical temperature where the, the single peak splits into two. And then it shows this uh, rubby like splitting. So the weak splitting at high temperatures and strong or ultra strong coupling at, at uh, low temperature. So our interpretation of this is what's changing as a function of temperature is G, right? Because G, light matter coupling, depends on the magnetization, which is changing as a function of temperature according to Curie's law. So, the, so G is the only one which is changing as a function of temperature in this situation. Kappa and gamma are constant as a function of temperature. So there's a so-called exceptional point here, if you, if you use this. So the above this temperature, there's a single solution in the real part. If you look at so G is smaller than this. So the, the, the frequency is just only the zero. But below this, G wins. G becomes larger than this. So the, the real part develops two solutions, while the imaginary part is only one. But it also changes frequency. Frequency, as yes. As so the, this goes like so, yes. so the hybridization in the cavity maybe changes yes. also because of that. Sure. Yeah. So G G changes as a function of temperature. So the Ravi is playing. Oh, G, G includes also the detuning. No. So so then what? Uh, the I mean, tuning the, is the, the magnum. The magnum frequency will change as it will get stiffer as you cool. There's no magnum, by the way. This is this is a paramag paramag. No, all right. Yeah. There's no. That I said that. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, why does why are kappa and gamma not? Because yeah. kappa is is, is uh is determined by the kappa group activity. Sure. Gamma, that's a good question. So we, we looked into this literature, yeah, gamma. What determines the line width of electron paramagnetic resonance? If it's mostly temperature independent at, at low temperature, it increases even. Wait, yeah. Sorry, if what I'm seeing here is not the polarization of the sample as your temperature drops below the energy difference. So that's not really G changing, right? So uh, let's see. Yeah, G, so if you think that G is at some intrinsic late matter coupling rate, yeah, so, so maybe G times some sort of some factor that is changing. That, yeah, so we, in our model, yeah, so basically we, we have this, we, we, we can explain this. So G, G naught, which is, which doesn't change it which is multiplied by the population time. What is the extra? It seems to like increase as you increase temperature. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's, it's noise. This is, no, it's not real. It seems to increase as you increase temperature. This, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is uh, some ma mathematical articles. Uh -huh. I'm Yes. So the photon in the cavity has a fixed polarization. No, in, in this case, no. Yeah. So so there's there's no polarization. But in in the next in the next case, I will talk about the, the polarization. So let me move on to the yeah one dimensional photonic crystal cavity. So the idea is we start with a photonic crystal, right? Which is a periodic photonic system which has a photonic band gap and then we remove one of the yeah plates and then which introduce a defect state which is the, the photonic cavity mode so in reality yes yes so in reality this is a, a repetition of silicon vacuum silicon vacuum silicon vacuum silicon vacuum Right. So and then yeah, after removal of the 
the central layer. So here the index contrast between silicon and vacuum is so large, 3.42 versus one. This means that they, we don't need to repeat many, many layers to make, make a, a broad mirror on, on, on each side. After, after two layers, the reflectivity is already 97% or so. After three layers, the reflectivity is only 99%. So typically we, we repeat this 10 minutes. Okay. So just two, two, two layers or, or, or three layers. Okay, and then I want to point out this, this is such a nice space laboratory in which to place an interesting quantum material. And the this is a transmission spectrum through an empty cavity without including any any material in the system. So this is a bandwidth a frequency range, right, from 0.1 or 0.2 terahertz to 2.5. Terahertz again, one terahertz is uh, four, four milli EV. So, uh, within this, there are three photonic band gaps or stop bands. And uh, within each stop band, we see a defect mode, photonic, photonic mode with, with good uh, now Q factors up to, up to 1000. So, the, so here 810. So, the, the typically the line width is a few, few gigahertz and the, uh, and the center frequency is, is a few terahertz. Okay? So a few gigahertz and a few terahertz. So 1,000 1, corresponding to a cavity photon lifetime of about 70 picoseconds and a cavity finesse of 100. So give, let me give you an example. We replace a, a gallium arsenide 2 deg, ultra high mobility 2 deg. Um, and then we apply a, Magnetic field, DC magnetic field, DC magnetic field, which yeah, so which quantizes the electronic energy spectrum into Landau levels, and then we come in with very very weak, weak. I want to emphasize very weak terahertz radiation to probe what's happening in the system. Again, what's happening is. These Landau quantized electrons are ultra strongly coupled with the vacuum electromagnetic fields inside the cavity. And uh, we have a very nice circular polarizer. So the, we, we send circularly polarized radiation. Right? So polarization is important here. This is important because the magnet, DC magnetic field uh, induces electron cyclotron motion, right? which has a definite direction of, of rotation. So the, there are two, two circular modes, sigma plus, sigma minus, or uh, cyclotron resonance active and cyclotron resonance inactive circular polarization. Only one of them is supposed to couple with the electrons in the usual weak coupling regime. But as you will see, in the ultra strong coupling regime, even the opposite circular cyclotron resonance inactive mode strongly couples with the uh, with the uh, electrons, so these are transmission spectra of, of different magnetic fields from minus three tesla to plus three tesla. Again, the sign of the magnetic field is important. So this is the upper polarizer mode. This is the uh, lower polarizer mode, and as you can see, the so so at zero degree is here right, about a plus. Uh, positive one Tesla. So this is 2G. This is our uh, uh, own resonance vacuum rabbit splitting, which is much, much larger than the, the, the line width. In terms of the collective uh, cooperativity, this is 3,513. And the, yeah, the vacuum rabbit splitting is about 72% of the resonance frequency, right? So definitely we are in the ultra strong coupling regime, and the most important feature here is here, in cyclotron resonance inactive polarization, which means that the electrons and photons are rotating in opposite directions, right? So the easiest way to think about this is, so everything's happening here. So the coupling is happening here on the positive side. If the coupling is weak, we shouldn't see anything. So this should be, this should stay as a photonic mode. 
everything should be happening on the positive magnetic field side. But as we increase the, the, the coupling strength, this repulsion, so that anti-crossing becomes larger and larger, it spills over into the negative range. So the in the in the ultra strong coupling range. So the even in the negative range, it's influenced. So this is this is due to the uh, the breakdown of the rotating wave approximation. So for, for example, if, if you look at the uh, James Cummings model, you have only the this and this. Okay, so this is the usual co-rotating terms. But you have to include the counter-rotating terms and the so-called a squared term. So this is this is very, very important in the physics of ultra strong coupling. So here, so here all the operators are photon operators. So photon photon self uh, field interaction. But there's a coefficient d which depends on g, light matter coupling. In the absence of light matter coupling, this term doesn't exist. Right? So photon photon correlation. Induced by like matter coupling. So this is this. I'll come back to this term if I have time. Yes, this might be nice. But can you look at the photonic signatures of, of what you're talking? About? Photon statistics. Yeah, that's that's tough. But some some good. I think Jerome. Yeah, he he knows how to do. It. I don't know. Um. <laughs> uh, that's that. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So we have a we have a theoretical model which which explains everything. So basically, the so this first experiment was done in a textbook semiconductor gallium mm -hmm. arsenide two deg. We we know everything about gallium arsenide, so it's it's rather boring. Okay? So so we want to study more interesting, yeah, quantum materials. Yes. Sorry, I think I should explain those polarities on that side. Okay, but it's not the polarity mode. Then why is it in the interface there? What do you mean? Is that a two-level system? It's a boson. It's a boson. Boson, boson. It's a real organization, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Then I don't need to be taking data on the mission to break down. The, the eight dagger terms are just the renormalization. Uh, the rotating wave, the eight square term is never there. So once it becomes significant, it means that you have gone beyond this. Let's let's talk about that during the during the coffee break. Okay, so gallium arsenide is boring, so we we want to move away from semiconductors. So we want to study interesting quantum materials, and we started working on superconductors. Right, so some of the authors of this very interesting stimulating theory papers are in in the audience, and I I promise to some of them that I I will produce some data. So, uh, we, we don't have any spectacular data yet, okay, but I, I want to give you a progress progress report, right? So to see, just, just to show you what we are trying to do, right? So the, yeah, so we, instead of uh, working with high TC superconductors, which we, we'll, we'll work on it uh, later, but we started working on a BCS, BCS superconductor, where the yeah, theories are more or less Understood. So the yeah. So this but this is a film from the, from the uh, transition temperature of nine k, and we put it in a one d uh, one d PCC, and this is an empty empty cavity spectrum, um, and then this uh, these are transmission spectra through a one d PCC containing a ni niobium nitride film, and the again there are more multiple modes and the, as a function of temperature below the transition temperature and above the temp uh, transition temperature. Uh, by the way, so the two delta, two delta is around here, 0 0.6 terahertz. Okay, so this is a region of interest. This is not very important. So, so as you can see, things are changing here, right? 
Uh, we also did some magnetic field dependence. So the when you go through the uh, HC2 spectra change. So the, there are multiple modes we, we can do. We can simulate other uh, the electromagnetic mode profiles of the different modes in the, in the in the cavity. For example, if you look at this <clears throat> this mode, this particular mode has a large amplitude at the location of the superconducting field. That is why this particular mode is strongly affected by the superconducting transition. But then when you go to this mode, yeah, smaller amplitude, and here, here uh, yeah, so that there's less influence on, on, on this mode. And we, so we, we also did free space characterization of the films to determine sigma one and sigma two complex conductivity. And we did the standard mathis bardeen analysis, one over omega type thing. And then, so we know the optical constants of, of, of this film in free space. But then we use the optical constants to go back to our simulation to see if the uh, transmission spectra of the cavity superconducting film can be reproduced. And basically, uh, above TC, more or less, we have agreement. But below TC, there are some deviations between the simulation and the uh, uh, experiment. OK. How much time? Okay, okay, sorry. Yes. So I have I have uh, three more topics. <laughs> yes. So that was including the question time. So I yes. just stop. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I just stopped. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I was wondering, so in this slice, niobium nitride, it's around a half a terahertz, about 600 years. There's also Higgs mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that but that doesn't have a dipole interest. That's right. right. That's right. But is there a way to so see the energy mixing it? That's right. You, if you apply a DC electric field in the train, it becomes optically active. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we're trying that. Okay. That'd be nice. This means it's the ball. Or is it the film? It's a, it's a film. Yeah. Okay, so it has surface blood. So can you couple to, because they have square root of huge portion, can you couple to those? Mm -hmm. So if blood? we have a grating, so, so, they, so right now we don't have any endpoint modulation. So we, all the couple is happening at two or zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Endpoint. <laughs> Systems in Brahman, they often seek out and find a few holes and say, No, don't we? Talking about that, yeah. Uh, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. You, you need a very special yeah. technique yeah. to couple with a Brahman, yeah. electronic Brahman, finite Q. You need a great technique to couple with finite Q. I guess my question is there, I guess, this will disorder not help you to couple, mm -hmm. but you don't need a great thing. There is all disorder. disorder. I see. Just like in quantum pole systems. Like Raman is supposed to couple to Q equal to zero, but they constantly see peaks from finite Q. Even without a break. Without a break. I see the disorder. Yes, that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, let's thank you again.